Hi, my name is Paul Vanderclaim, I'm the pastor of Livingstone's Christian Reformed Church, and I'm doing a series of small videos about the language of the Bible and how the pieces fit together, hopefully so that we can have a richer, fuller sense of how the Bible talks and how then we can inhabit the story. In my last video, I talked about the creation. I talked about the man, the woman, and the garden, how the man and the woman who are the gardeners rebel against God, and this God surprisingly doesn't just kill them and make new gardeners, but he in fact, in a sense, seeds the palace backyard to the rebels, and that's in a sense out of where the story out of which the Bible flows. And we talked about the fact that there's no altar in the garden in Genesis 2 and 3. But in Genesis 4, an altar appears, and we find Cain and Abel offering sacrifices to this God. And we talked briefly last time about how the purpose of the altar is to bridge the divorce between heaven and earth, to once again make contact between the rebels on earth and the great king in heaven. And I want to talk a little bit about what an altar is and how it functions. Again, for many of us today, if let's say someone has what we call an altar in their home, it might be a shelf, and on that shelf maybe a picture of a loved one and some candles, and that is kind of what we think of as an altar. And that, that got to us through a long line of things that I can't go into. But in the ancient world, that's kind of an altar, but everybody understood what a real altar was. What a real altar was is not a lot different from what we would look at as a barbecue grill today. It's, it's usually a stand of, let's say, earth or stones. Um, and in, in the Hebrew law, the stones of the altar couldn't be cut stones. They had to be natural stones. And, and then what you do on top of the altar, you of course have a fire in the altar, and then you place your sacrifice, which is often an animal, on top of the altar. Now, again, a lot of us moderns look at this and say, now why would God like this? Now maybe we like the smell of, of barbecue or something on the altar, and the Bible in fact talks about this pleasing aroma but, but why would God like this? Well, again, let's, let's look at the basic story and understand what's at heart. You have heaven above, you have the waters, you have the dry ground, you have earth, and on the earth you have an altar, and the goal of the altar is to bridge the divide between heaven and earth. But how would an altar bridge the divide between heaven and earth? In the book of Leviticus, when God creates, when God commands Israel to make the tabernacle, there's a very interesting thing that happens in Leviticus 9 and 10, where God, in fact, lights the fire on the altar. Now, that might sound weird, but if you, again, do a concordance search of fire in the Bible, you find how often God associates with fire. When Moses is out in the wilderness shepherding, in that sense, far, diff far distant from God, he has tried to be the rescuer of his people. Now he's run away from Egypt. He's minding sheep in the desert. And there's a, there's a bush which is burning, but the bush is not consumed. And that clearly is meant to image God's presence. And God is there in the bush. And this then will kind of become an image of Israel in the desert. Well, in the story in Leviticus, he has the people of Israel make the altar, make the tabernacle, and then God himself lights the altar. Well, what does that mean? Well, you notice because the two sons of Aaron bring strange fire to the altar and God kills them. And again, we read this and we say, well, what, what is that about? Why would God kill them? Well, the point is how an altar works. An altar is, in a sense, the presence of God, which is the fire of God, that he comes and lights the altar. And the law is that the altar, the Israelites are not to allow the fires of the altar to go out. In that sense, what is the altar? The altar is the very presence of God in the midst of his people as fire. Okay? Understand that again. The altar is the very presence of God in the midst of his people as fire. 
Well, then what do you do with an altar? Well, you take an animal and you put it on top of the altar. Well, what happens with the carcass just living a few moments before because they slit its throat and drain it of blood before they put it on the altar? What then is the imagery of this carcass on the altar? It's the imagery of our flesh in contact with the fire of God and what in fact happens with that contact. Well, the sacrifice is consumed. And again, if you read the book of Leviticus, you'll notice that before the family brings the altar to the, the victim, to the sacrifice, the father representing the family places his hands on the sacrifice and in a sense brings the sins of the family, puts it on the head of the animal, and the animal then goes into the fire of God and it is consumed. Now, this is a vivid picture about our divorce from God. Now, what does it mean then for us to willingly participate in this ritual where we, in fact, come into contact with God and we are consumed by fire? Well, again, if you read the Leviticus, the, the wanderings of Israel in Numbers and Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, again and again and again, you see this picture happening. That our sin on us, coming in contact with God, we are consumed by flames. Now, what does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like hell? All the New Testament image, some of the New Testament imagery of hell, the lake of fire, where the devil and, and those in, in allegiance with the devil are thrown into the lake of fire. All of these images tie together. And so an altar for the people of the ancient world is a very vivid representation of the fundamental relationship and the problem between us and God. And that is, in fact, how the altar bridges the distance between us and God. Now, I went up a little bit longer. This is, this is a very strange concept for us to get in our heads, but it's helpful to understand if we're going to understand why in the Bible you have all these altars. Where are altars present? Where are they not? What are altars supposed to do? And of course, finally later, how is Jesus the sacrifice for us? So again, if you have any questions, please um, drop me a note, put a comment in the comment section, and I hope to make some more videos. Thanks for watching.